we shall move over to our next speaker now, uh, who is Costanza Toninelli from CNR INO. And she will be talking about scalable integration of Fourier limited molecules in 3D polymetric photonic structures. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I guess so. So uh, thanks a lot, the organizer, for putting together the conference and also for the huge efforts they put into this, transferring it into a virtual format. So this allows me today to be talking from home, which is uh, really not very far from Florence Cathedral, which is many cathedrals in the world uh, holds its own record. And that is uh, the largest dome made out of stone. In ever. So um, this year is also the 600 year anniversary of uh, Florence Dome. So for this reason, and because we are a quantum nanophotonic group, we decided to realize its uh, uh, quantum nanophotonic counterpart by placing a quantum emitters inside a dome that was scaled down to about uh, five microns. So that's more or less what my talk is going to be about. Okay, so what is special about quantum emitters in general and single molecules in particular? Well, the first thing is that if you have a quantum object and you can isolate a single one that is strongly interacting with the, the electromagnetic field, you can uh, realize a highly non-classical light state. And in particular, a single photon source would generate a train of pulses with one and only one photon per pulse. Now you have to keep in mind that we're talking about objects that have sizes smaller than a nanometer, which means that, uh, in, in, and they also feel uh, very much the environment around them, which means that uh, they can operate as transducer and uh, realize sensors that combine uh, high spatial resolution together with uh, extreme sensitivity. Now, another bottom line of single molecules in the solid state is that uh, we can, being solid state emitters, you can integrate them in the same photonic platform. And in particular, we are currently leading a European project aiming at the integration of both functionalities, single photon emission and sensing within the same uh, quantum networks, where also single photon detectors and uh, graphene membranes are included. Okay, so the way we do this in Florence uh, is uh, through molecular quantum nanophotonics. So, and the vision is the following. Essentially, we believe that uh, in the same way organic materials have played a major role in fields such as solar cell and display technology, they might be beneficial also in quantum optics, as long as we are able to work with single molecules, single organic molecules, and we can effectively interface them with the, the electromagnetic field. So we have recently, for instance, demonstrated that you can realize very efficient single photon sources based on single molecule that can be applied in quantum metrology. And indeed in this work, we were essentially using a molecule to calibrate a single photon detector against uh, uh, the primary standard for photon fluxes at PTB. Okay, so this is how good the source can be. So it's already uh, able to be applied in quantum metrology. Another field of research is related to the uh, sensing. And this is done in collaboration with Frank Coppens and people at ICFO. And it is based on the interaction between our quantum emitters and uh, membranes of 2D materials. So today I'd like to focus on the integration into a photonic platform. That is definitely not a piece of cake for any type of quantum emitters. As you might know, in the moment in which you start structuring the environment around a quantum dot or a color center in diamond, this often degrades uh, its quantum coherence. So let's see how far we can go with molecules. So these are the papers that I will be touching during our discussion. Okay, so um, 
quantum emitters hold promise for the deterministic generation of single photons. And the idea is simple. So using triggered excitation, you can effectively populate the excited state of a radiative transition and after spontaneous emission obtain a train of pulses with one and only one photon per pulse. Now, if this whole process is efficient, then this source works on a push bottom operation which means, very importantly, that you can cascade several of them and realize an N single photon Fox state, okay? This is an important resource for photonic quantum technologies that are essentially based on networks where photons propagate and undergo quantum interference whenever they meet at the node of the network. Now, Indeed, here you need uh, a, a scalable source, a deterministic source, and at the same time, you need coherent interaction. So this brings me to the challenges of uh, quantum emitters in the solid state, which are affected by the coherence due to the interaction with the, the environment. So this typically degrades the visibility of the two-photon interference. That's why we have to work at uh, three Kelvin. Um, and I will show you some results about that. The other important uh, figure of merit that we have to take into account is the efficiency of the entire process, uh, which we will name brightness. And then of course, also the purity of the single photon state. Now, one relevant way to go is uh, to couple uh, molecules to, uh, to wave cats and cavities, because in this way we can enhance the brightness, so the efficiency of the process, and to a certain extent control the optical properties of the emission and even modify this. At the same time, one can envisage integration of source, processor, and detector in the same miniaturized physical platform. Okay, so I'm talking about in particular polyaromatic hydrocarbons and Alex Clark did an excellent job in presenting also the, the case of a PAH molecules, which are uh, carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb lattice, hydrogen terminated. They possess optical transition from the visible to the near infrared and uh, very importantly for us, they can be manipulated in, in solution which means that with a very easy and cheap fabrication method, we can embed them in crystalline matrices, which make the system photostable. So maybe this is not obvious to everyone, so let me repeat this once more. In this context, molecules can be interrogated, the same molecule can be interrogated for months inside a cryostat. So about uh, the uh, energy diagrams, you will find again electronic excitations accompanied by a manifold of vibrational levels. And uh, upon absorption, then you have a fast uh, picosecond relaxation to the vibronic ground state, followed by the emission of fluorescent photons. And as Alex man mentioned, uh, if the intersystem crossing yield is unlikely, as it's the case for DBT in anthracene, you can get quantum yield very close to one. Now, the transition which is interesting is the zero, zero, zero phonon line that is potentially not affected by uh, the phasing and scattering by phonons. So this has a typical probability ranging from 30 to 50%. Now, in order to, uh, to verify the coherence between these two electronic levels, uh, we typically carry out excitation spectroscopy, which means that we uh, scan the laser frequency through the excited state uh, uh, line and correspondingly collect the red-shifted fluorescence. So this is what you're uh, watching in this movie, where you see different molecules popping up and being switched uh, off because they go off resonance. Now, if you zoom on one of these molecule, you uh, would estimate a line width that is only 40 megahertz, and that is really only limited by the lifetime of the excited state. So, um, yeah, okay, the fact that they are not uh, popping up altogether is related to a residual inhomogeneous broadening that can be compensated by several means that I will discuss in uh, what follows. Another way to 
estimate the coherence is by looking at uh, the uh, second order autocorrelation function, which carries the dynamics uh, of the uh, row two tool of the excited state population. So in this case, you clearly can appreciate several Rabi oscillations, which are dumped on a time scale that's twice the, uh, the T1. Now, uh, our colleagues in Stuttgart, for instance, have used exactly um, single photons uh, coming from the zero photon line under off-resonant excitation to perform a Hongo Mandel experiment and retrieve the visibility of 95%. So you can see these are potentially excellent sources for linear optical quantum computing and photonic uh, quantum technologies in general, but there's a problem and this is that if you don't play any uh, photonic game, then you are bound with efficiencies, collection efficiencies of the order of 2%. So this is what uh, essentially our um, expertise in Florence brings about. And our first uh, attempt was the coupling of uh, single molecules to reach waveguides uh, based on uh, this uh, uh, paper by Jesu Kuang and co-workers. So the idea is that you can exploit the high evanescent tail of a tightly confined mode in a silicon nitride waveguide, uh, about which we have heard um, all the good aspects of CMOS compatibility and so on. So uh, this uh, is possible because we can fabricate molecules in very thin films and deposit them everywhere on top of the surface where the silicon nitride waveguides and the great thin outcouplers are uh, fabricated. By selecting molecules that are in close proximity with the waveguide, we can then uh, observe fluorescence in correspondence uh, uh, to the great thin outcouplers and estimate an efficiency uh, of uh, uh, 40% emission uh, considering both propagation direction. So that was uh, a very good result. So if you consider the, how simple the, the uh, hybrid device fabrication was, but uh, the bad point was that this is more or less as far as you can get with uh, this type of coupling, so evanescent coupling. And on top of that, it is not suitable if you want to scale up to complex arrays of single photon sources because the positioning was not deterministic. So how can we instead go for deterministic positioning and enhance the coupling efficiency to go to uh, an array of single photon sources? So we decided to fabricate nanocrystals and uh, because this would enable a number of possible integration strategies uh, from microinfiltration uh, to uh, standard lithographic technique when we disperse this nanocrystal in a polymer photoresist. Well, that was the idea. Then uh, how about the realization? Well, the fabrication of the nanocrystal was uh, surprisingly easy and actually we uh, were simply inspired by a, a standard re re precipitation recipe in a organic chemistry book. What was less obvious was the photostability of an emitter in such an environment, as we know that, for instance, similar uh, emitters uh, such as uh, um, silicon vacancies in nanodiamonds, uh, they suffer from spectral diffusion due to the interaction with the, char the charges on the surface of the nanocrystals. On the contrary, what we could observe was that the purity of the single photon state was still very high, the line width was still close to the lifetime limit, and most importantly, the line was extremely photostable, which we observed by repeatedly scanning the laser through the excited state. Okay, so um, can we really play with these nanocrystals, as I said? So the first uh, thing we did was in collaboration with Frank, Frank Coppens at ICFO was to uh, try doing e-beam lithography to position our nanocrystal on pre-structured chips, such as the silicon nitride waveguide that I was mentioning before. But this time I want the nanocrystal only in a well-defined position. So uh, we then checked uh, uh, the fluorescence was still there after the whole writing and developing process was performed. And uh, even going to cryogenic temperature, the line width were still reasonably narrow. So encouraged by these results, so we decided to uh, be even more ambitious and realize everything in one step. So can we really 
have a quantum nanophotonic chip made out of polymer uh, embedding uh, single molecules quantum emitters. So this would allow like a, a one step, very inexpensive fabrication of it. Uh, three dimensionality means you can effectively play with the polarization and uh, you can have place the emitter wherever you want uh, in a, a region where the electromagnetic field is maximized. So potentially you can combine deterministic positioning and enhanced coupling efficiency. So we were uh, very excited about that, but of course then someone had to try it. So um, we uh, have um, realized by now uh, several different geometries, both suspended such as this arch waveguide and also monolithic such as um, this uh, sort of Florence dome uh, architecture. Now, um, these are uh, the experimental results uh, of the uh, electron uh, SEM images where you see the quality of the fabricated devices. In each of these structures, there is, a, a, in this case here at the center and here at the base, there is a, a single anthracene nanocrystal contain, in this case, a, a, a big number of molecules. You see that fluorescence persists after the whole fabrication process. Now, we uh, decided to isolate the case of the dome on gold. We have then um, performed a characterization of the morphology of the dome with atomic force microscopy. And then let's see what happens to the molecule once embedded inside the dome. So our most important uh, figure of merit in this case was the collection efficiency. Oh, sorry, here I lost uh, the X label is uh, the detected photons at, uh, so the count rate at the detector. So these 2.5 means uh, 2 million and a half photons at the detector. So this is what typically you get from nanocrystal on a glass substrate. And once embedded inside the dome, we got finally a factor 12 enhancement uh, corresponding to about 40% collection efficiency. So we were very happy with that uh, and also because this corresponded to a nice special mode uh, resulting in a 50% collection efficiency into a single mode fiber. But how about the coherence properties of such photons? We said that this is typically uh, not trivial to, uh, uh, to obtain inside a, a microstructure uh, system. So here what you're uh, are observing is instead that the uh, single photon purity is very good uh, and is not affected by any residual fluorescence of the uh, polymer. The emitter is still close to the lifetime limit and also photostability is preserved. So with that, uh, I'd like to, um, to acknowledge all my collaborators in Florence and abroad, and in particular, Maya Colauti, who uh, was the, uh, essentially the main uh, author and who dared to, uh, uh, to try this experiment. Now, since I have a couple of minutes left, as far as I understand, I'd like to, uh, one minute left, okay, just to mention quickly what are the um, tuning methods that we have to compensate for the residual inhomogeneous broadening between molecules going in this direction of an array of single photon uh, sources. So the um, say traditional uh, stark shifting method applies to molecule and in particular we have in this paper demonstrated how this can be efficiently implemented by using graphene or MOS2 as transparent electrodes and in this graph you see that by using bilayer graphene for instance we could scan the molecule zero phonon line through hundreds of gigahertz so definitely through the entire inhomogeneous broadening. One last uh, uh, remark uh, this is our uh, most recent result uh, and is indeed uh, not published yet, is that how can we instead um, say scale up also our tuning method and integrate this and have it on an integrated chip? Because this is obviously not easy to uh, selectively define the electric field within micron scale. So we accidentally discovered that you can actually use um, a secondary pump beam in order to um, 
locally induce an electric field which permanently shift the molecule transition frequency. And in this way, we brought in resonance within twice their line with five independent emitters, which before were 20 gigahertz apart. And these all in, uh, in such a small scale of, let's say, uh, less than 50 micron. Okay, with that, uh, I'm done and I'm eager to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Costanza. Perfectly on time. Um, so th um, thanking you also on behalf of the 200 odd uh, people who are watching your talk right now. So I'll just jump straight in with the questions. Dara asks, is the increase in collection efficiency a lensing effect or is there resonant in brackets per cell enhancement also? Okay, that's a good question. And here's the answer. So here we have uh, done, it's, it's, it's a combination of the two. So let's say the personal enhancement is very little. It's a, it's more simple sort of lens effect. It's a micro lens effect. So in this, uh, you find all the details also in this publication. Uh, and here I reported the collection efficiency. And uh, on this other line, instead, you have the photon flux, uh, which takes into account also a, a possible, let's say, personal factor. Uh, but I mean, it, it, it's very little in this case. So we just okay. have in the end a, a, an underlying uh, gold mirror. We don't have any cavity here. Okay, thank you. Um, Anka Lohman asks, does the surface roughness of the structures impact the outcomes? Uh, not really in this case. And also, um, no, because I mean, in the end, surface roughness in, on this scale were some uh, 40 nanometer, uh, peak to peak, if I remember correctly. And, uh, but it's true that possibly this can be uh, optimized and there can be also some other annealing step to further reduce the surface roughness for a more complex structure, I mean. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and uh, Alex Clark asks, does the final G2 plot from the gold-backed dome, um, that's just jumped and moved around, uh, does the final G2 uh, two plots from the gold back dome use resonant pumping. If so, why are there no Rabi oscillations? Is it low power? It is low power. It is low power and, uh, um, and it is resonant pumping. Yeah, low power. Okay. Um, uh, Panis asks, I'm wondering how you use monolayer graphene in your 3D structures. Sorry if you mentioned it in the talk. Sorry, how do we use in, in 3D structure? No, no, in this case, the, the bilayer graphene was in, um, sorry, can I go back here? It was just a multi-layer essentially. So we have our nanocrystal embedded in a polyvinyl alcohol layer and uh, mm -hmm. a graphene layer and, or bilayer or MOS2 was uh, um, exfoliated flake was deposited on top. Thanks for that clarification. Um, so and we look through the graphene, that's why I said these are good transparent electrodes. Okay. And I think we've got time for one more uh, question. Uh, Zhi Zhang Kung, sorry if I uh, mispronounced that. Is the laser heating method similar to the one from Grim et al. Nature Materials 2019 using strain? Um, strain is okay, so I, I know the paper there. So it's not a heating effect. We believe this has to do with uh, a generation of uh, photoionization cascade. So we are trying to describe this in uh, details. And we, this is also backed up with quantum, low level quantum chemistry calculations. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a permanent effect. And I think in this paper by Grimm et al, the, uh, the authors is, is probably referring to uh, with quantum dots. And uh, in this case, they were using uh, phase change materials, if I'm not mistaken. And here, this is, we don't have to add any extra layer or any extra material. It's all embedded in our, in our simple, um, our simple uh, bare nanocrystal, let's say. There's no extra fabrication process. Okay, thank you. I think that's 
all we've got time for for, for questions. There's a, there's a couple more. I'm sure they'll get put into the Slack channel. Um, thank you again, Costanza. Thanks.